Hello, this is ECG case number 11. Uh, let's take a look at the case this time. Uh, the scenario I gave for this ECG is you respond to an 80 year old female that's become unresponsive while using the, the toilet. Uh, she currently feels a little lightheaded but has no other complaints. So this story kind of you know, tells us a lot of things. Maybe she had a vasovagal event uh, while she was uh, making a bowel movement. So one of the questions we might want to ask is if she was going number one or number two, and if, if she was going number one, has she been having frequent urination? It was, you know, what kind of brought on uh, these symptoms? How long was she out? Did she fall down? You obviously want to rule out any types of trauma. Um, if she was uh, going number two, if she was making a bowel movement, you're going to want to ask, you know, were you straining? Was there any blood in the stool? Uh, anything like that. Uh, and then when you ask her about her medical history, she gives you that big sigh and tells you, uh, where do I begin? Kind of leading you into understanding that she has a whole lot of medical problems. Okay. And here's the EKG I gave with that very limited amount of history. And it's a very interesting EKG. There's a lot of people that chimed in and had different ideas about it. I think, uh, you know, most people were kind of going down the right track. So, let, let's kind of dissect it a little bit. First thing, let's look at the rhythm. Okay, we do see uh, P waves, uh, okay, and we, and we see P waves with every QRS complex, okay? If you, if you don't see them, take a look at uh, lead two. That's probably the best in lead two. You have P waves right there. Uh, it's kind of off right there. Before every QRS complex, okay, and your PR interval is pretty consistent, and it looks to be within the normal limits, the, the PR interval. You don't see any extra P waves anywhere, okay? And I, I'd say that they're pretty upright in all of these leads here. They may be a little bit negative in AVL, but for all intents and purposes, probably a sinus rhythm. Um, if you wanted to say it's an ectopic atrial rhythm, you probably could because AVL does appear to have a negative P wave. Remember, for it to be a sinus P wave, it should be positive in all of these limb leads and negative in AVR. Okay, positive in all uh, five of these leads and then in AVR, it should be negative for it to be truly sinus. Okay, and that's kind of just a rule of thumb. So we're, we say we have a sinus rhythm. Now let's take a look at the axis. Okay, which is kind of interesting because most of our you know leads are kind of biphasic here in a way. Lead one looks almost equiphasic. So you can't really use the quadrant method to determine your axis here, your quick quadrant method. First thing you're going to want to do is make sure your electrodes are on appropriately, which they are. Next, you'd have to try to revert back to that hexaxial diagram in your head that I taught you in the, the uh, axis tutorial, or maybe you learned it through uh, another means. And if you picture that, that diagram and you know lead one, okay, it goes from left to right. And then AVF is kind of perpendicular to lead one. So if lead one is equiphasic, we know the axis is perpendicular to that. And if AVF is also perpendicular, the axis must be in line with AVF. And since AVF is negative, it's going to be at the negative side of AVF. And if you picture it in your head, AVF, okay, it goes up and down. And the positive electrode is at the bottom and the negative electrode is up top at about negative 90 degrees. So we could say... Here, let me put it where you can see it. Negative 90 degrees is up top. We could say that the axis is close to negative 90 degrees. We probably have some kind of pathological left axis deviation. Okay, and AVR, it, it looks to be mostly positive. Okay, so that's always concerning. You shouldn't see AVR mostly positive, but if you did have a QRS axis close to negative 90 degrees, it would be mostly positive, so that makes sense. So let's look further. Let's look for, you know, any types of Oh, and the other part of the axis, before I get ahead of myself, the precordial axis, of course, uh, we have early R-wave progression. Early R-wave progression. We have a differential for that. Let me just write down quickly right here. Uh, for early R-wave progression, I have a few things I like to think of. Uh, right bundle branch block, okay? And along the same lines is a uh, right ventricular strain, okay? Posterior wall, MI, and WPW. Those are the main things that come to mind when I think of uh, early R-wave progression. And what does that mean, early R-wave progression? Well, let's take a look back here at the EKG. 
Since V1 has a very positive QRS complex, right off the bat, you know you have earlier wave progression. V1 should be almost all negative. You should have barely any, if at all, uh, uh, an R wave in V1. So we have a very tall R wave. We know that one of those things must be present. So uh, if, you, if you look at your durations now, at your intervals, you'll see that the QRS complex is wide. And we know with a wide QRS complex, if it's supraventricular, like a sinus rhythm is, or you know, a rhythm with a P wave with every QRS complex, then you must have some sort of aberrancy, like a bundle branch block. And sure enough, uh, it fits the right bundle branch block pattern. It has a terminal R wave. Uh, if you remember my bundle branch block lecture, uh, if the last wave is up, think of pushing up on your turn signal, because if you push up on your turn signal, you'd be turning to the right, or indicating that you're turning to the right. And sure enough, if the last wave of the QRS complex in V1 is up, that indicates a right bundle branch block. So coupled, this right bundle branch block morphology, uh, right bundle branch block morphology here, uh, and then you have to have the terminal S waves in leads one and V6, which we do, that makes it a true right bundle branch block. And with this left axis deviation, okay, now left axis deviation can be due to uh, numerous things, uh, if it's pathological, the most common thing is a left anterior fascicular block, which this kind of fits the pattern of having a, you know, almost all positive monomorphic QRS complex in AVL. And, you know, we said we had an axis about negative 90 degrees. That would make this a bifascicular block, a bifascicular block. If, in fact, you have pathological left axis deviation from a left anterior fascicular block. So you have a left anterior fascicular block. So that's one fascicle of the left bundle branch. And then you have a right bundle branch block. Okay. The right bundle branch is entirely blocked. So that's two fascicles. You have a bifascicular block. These patients are at high risk of eventually needing maybe a pacemaker uh, before they have a complete heart block. Remember, that's why the condition of a left bundle branch block is worse than a right bundle branch block. Because if you have a left bundle branch block, you have a bifascicular block. But this is kind of equal to that. You have here, you have one of your left fascicles blocked, and you have your right fascicle blocked, so you have a bifascicular block as well. And looking back at the EKG now, uh, you, you have other things in your differential for left axis deviation, but for, for the matter of this discussion, we're going to say uh, it's a left anterior fascicular block. Now we got to look for ST uh, and T wave changes, maybe some, you know, anything that could be pathological, MI-related, stuff like that. We know with bundle branch blocks, we have something called discordance, appropriate discordance. And if you look at V3, it kind of illustrates that very well. You have a terminal R wave and a negative T wave or an inverted T wave. That's discordance, and that's appropriate for bundle branch blocks, okay? And you also see the same thing in V4. You see discordance, but then you have kind of inappropriate concordance in V5, where the T wave's inverted, and then pretty much all of your uh, inferior leads, you see the same thing, where your last wave is negative and your T wave is in fact negative. That's not necessarily appropriate. You need to definitely treat the patient if you're thinking MI. In fact, this morphology in V4, this kind of coved ST segment, looks a little pathological. It looks a lot like an MI will look with a right bundle branch block. Uh, but you don't have any ST elevation. If you drew that line across there, that TP segment, it's the J point is not elevated. So you don't have any ST elevation in, in indicating an injury. Okay, this could be a persistent pattern from a previous injury. All right, uh, let's look further at the CKG. Do we see any ST elevation? Well, some people might think that they see ST depression in these inferior leads with ST elevation over here. If you don't, don't let me confuse you because there isn't. I just want to point something out. Now, this is not the ST segment right, right there. That is part of the QRS complex. And to know that, you, you look over at V1, you can see your, your QRS complex width. Your QRS complex stays the same width throughout this entire EKG. Your rhythm has not changed. You have not developed any aberrancy on top of what you already have. So it's the same width. So if you take this width here, okay, and you measure over here, you'll see that this is all included in the QRS complex. That's not ST depression, that's just an RSS prime sort of wave. It's, it's atypical, but it can happen. 
Um, and also, if you just drew lines down from where your, your QRS begins in AVR, well, I can't really draw a straight line there, can I? You can see where it begins and ends in the other leads, okay? So you don't have ST elevation or ST depression there. It's just part of the QRS complex, okay? Um, and then the other thing that's abnormal in this EKG is these Q waves in the septal uh, and anterior leads, okay? So... This patient has Q waves, uh, probably persistent from a previous MI. You're going to have to ask her further questions about her history, obviously, because she didn't give you a whole lot to begin with. Um, but these Q waves, they're, they're, they look persistent, uh, as if she had an anterior septal MI in the past, and now she has Q waves present on this EKG, which would help us understand why we see some of the other changes. She doesn't have any acute findings, although, like I said before, V4 does look sort of acute in its appearance, but there's no real elevation there. Uh, and the inverted T waves, we'd have to eventually find out if she had an old EKG. But there's nothing here to call STEMI alert on. Um, this patient ended up having just a GI bleed. Uh, she, she did have blood in her stool. I didn't want to give you all of that, but she ended up having a GI bleed. She did not vasovagal that we know of. Uh, she, she ended up having, she was hypotense on the way in. She got to the hospital. She ended up having a GI bleed. No, this 12 leads is the same as her previous. Um, but it was interesting. I thought it was a, a pretty interesting 12 lead, and I thought I would share it. You have a few things. You have a bifascicular block uh, from pathological left to axis deviation. You have a right bundle branch block present. And then you have those anterior septal Q waves and kind of persistent concordant uh, T wave inversion in the inferior leads, which I thought was quite interesting. So that's pretty much the dissection of this EKG. I say it's a uh, it's a right bundle branch block with an old MI. You do have some findings that could be acute um, if, if you had symptomology to go along with it. And if you didn't have a previous EKG, which we don't usually have in pre-hospital medicine, we don't usually have that previous EKG. So you might want to uh, triage to a cardiac facility. Don't call STEMI alert. You, know, you don't want to mobilize a cath team unless you do have a dynamic EKG or if you do have some ST elevation start to occur. Um, so don't go along those lines, but getting them to a cardiac facility, if it's not hours out of the way, is completely appropriate, you know, just to make sure that this patient's not having some sort of acute event. All right, uh, as I started last week, I wanted to start giving you some EKG resources other than just my videos and, and my blog. This is uh, Dr. Amal Matu's EKG video, Tumblr, website, whatever you'd like to call it, and weekly he puts up these EKG videos and they are great. If you like learning from my videos, you know, he's a little bit more advanced. He's an emergency physician, and he really is just an EKG guru, uh, self-proclaimed uh, EKG nerd. So check out his stuff. Uh, you can see the video on there. It says Spotic Sign. If you haven't learned about Spotic Sign, that's something that's actually new to me, and it's very interesting when uh, considering acute pericarditis versus uh, some sort of infarct. So Go to this uh, URL down here on the bottom, uh, or just Google uh, Amomatu EKG, and it'll bring up his videos, and you can uh, check those out. They're really good. If you have any EKGs or any questions that you'd like to send me, send them to this email, paramedicine101 at gmail.com. Uh, I'll get back to you. I love getting emails and seeing EKGs that you guys get out in the field. Uh, have a good one. Have a happy holidays. Merry Christmas, and I will see you next time.